Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, recording continue. Okay, everyone can, should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, first of all, I'm going to uh, introduce myself a little bit here. So you know um, who you're talking to. So uh, I'm Dr. Kevin Wood. I'm at the University of Washington Cooperative Institute for Climate, Ocean and Ecosystem Studies and also the NOAA Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory based in Seattle, which is why it's still dark outside here. Um, so I'm a, I'm a scientist. I, I, um, before becoming a scientist, I was in the Merchant Marine for about 25 years and kept plenty of log books in my day. Um, but uh, when I realized I needed to spend a little bit of time on land, I changed career, uh, Mid midstream and uh, got a degree in geophysics, um, but mostly um, I do this sort of historical uh, data rescue kind of work. That's my the favorite my favorite part of what I do with NOAA. Um, so I look for um, specific kinds of historical data, in particular instrumental marine weather observations, and also descriptive reports of sea ice. So. Most of my career has been spent either in the Arctic or the Antarctic. So I have a, an affinity for sea ice, I guess. But uh, our aim uh, collectively, all of Old Weather and, and my professional colleagues is to improve the, the tools that we use to understand and predict future weather and climate for the benefit of everyone. Um, and this includes things like uh, um, understanding uh, how um, hazardous weather is gonna evolve uh, during climate change, what the frequency and intensity of storms might turn into looking 50 or 100 years down the road. Um, but what we're doing um, is uh, fundamentally interdisciplinary. It takes historians, it takes climatologists, um, data scientists um, to, to make this all work. Um, and interestingly enough, the work that we're doing is actually an extension of an idea that emerged in the 1840s, which, uh, which was put in motion by uh, Matthew Mari, the Navy director of uh, the charts, um, depot of charts and instruments for the Navy back then, who realized that in order to understand the ocean and the ocean climate, you needed a lot of volunteers to send information back to the Navy about what they saw when they were out at sea. And that's basically, we're still taking advantage of his idea now. The, um, the difference is, and why there's basically a game change in this whole topic is we have what's called retrospective analysis. And this is something that only emerged uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago um, as our uh, computing power increased dramatically and the digitization of things became widespread. Um, so what, what a retrospective analysis does, or reanalysis for short, is it is basically a forecast engine, but it can ingest every historical weather observation ever made. And then with that, generate a reconstruction of the global atmosphere for every three hours for every day since 1838 or so. It's a moving target because as we get more data, we can push further back in time. The, um, the issue is though, uh, reanalysis runs on old data. And that is what we create through old weather as we recover and digitize manuscript data um, that is required to make reanalysis work. So that's the work of old weather. So, what does this look like? <coughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to play this video here. What this is is uh, output from uh, our latest um, reanalysis, latest NOAA reanalysis called uh, the 20th Century Reanalysis. It needs, it needs to have a name change at some point because um, now we're back to about 1838. But 
uh, what you're going to see is the um, the reanalysis reconstruction of past weather with what you can see here on the screen already is this sort of grayed out area. We call that the fog of uncertainty. And what you'll notice is where we have a lot of observations, the fog of uncertainty is dissipated. And that's, that's sort of a visual way of imagining what we're doing. With every observation we recover from the past, it clears up a little bit of that fog. And another important point here is that it doesn't take that much. So if there's a ship collecting data, um, well, you can see over here on the uh, left side of the screen, sort of where you might imagine why it might be, there's this bullet hole in the fog. That's because there's a ship there. So not only is the work that we're doing important in general, the work we do uh, can very specifically clear up this fog of ignorance with only a few barometric pressure observations. That's because um, barometric pressure affects is a is an indicator of a wide area of what's going on in the atmosphere, about a thousand kilometers in circumference. So one observation can actually clear up a fair chunk of uh, the fog of ignorance. Anyway, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna see if I can play this. Um, I'm gonna move it over here. So you can see, so we're back in 1850. And what you can see is where, where there are land stations and where there's a lot of ships, the fog of ignorance is um, cleared up. So you can see the North Atlantic trade routes across the top of the map pretty clearly. And then uh, some other stuff in the Southern hemisphere and over in, in, uh, in, the, in uh, the East Indies and China, where there's always been a lot of marine activity since the 1830s or 40s at least. Um, and then as you see, as time goes by, more observations are recovered in the, and we get a better idea of what's happening over more of the earth. Um, and so what you're seeing specifically, the black dots are stations. The color, the blue to yellow color is the temperature that you can see there's um, moving arrows, which is the wind. And then the green is uh, precipitation. And that tends to, um, uh, show up when there's a low pressure, as you would imagine. So that sort of gives you a visual sense of where there might be a storm, for example. And every once in a while, you can see they swirl around just like a cyclone. But undoubtedly, um, this is a powerful, powerful tool. In fact, it's perhaps the most important tool in, in climatology right now alongside of uh, global climate models. Okay, so I'm going to move this out of the way. Close that. Um, should we pause? Does, does anybody have any questions about uh, that bit at the moment? If you have a question, you can uh, unmute and ask or put it in the chat box. Okay. Um, so the next thing I want to show. It's pretty is, cool, Kevin. I'll just tell you that. It is cool. Um, and it is, um, you know, we go back and look at specific inc um, incidents, storms and things like that. And we find that it actually does a remarkable good job. I mean, I think uh, we have a, a good enough handle on the physics that if we have observations, we can produce a, a fairly faithful reconstruction um, down to the um, cyclone scale. So for a, for a, you know, a 500 mile area, um, you know, we can see, and I'll, I'll show you a couple more things here as we go along. So I'm going to jump over to, um, to this website, which we produced um, in collaboration with one of our um, partners at the National Archives, which is the National Archives Foundation. And if you go here, let me, uh, what I can do here. Um, okay, close that. Having a little, uh, I'll type it in for you. 
Okay, yeah, I'm having uh, trouble getting back to the chat box because of all the things I have open. Anyway, we can still see this um, Seas of Knowledge website. Is that correct? Can you see it? Okay, so uh, this website gives you an overall picture of how the whole process works from us um, imaging logbooks at the National Archives or wherever the case may be. And once we have the images, then in order to turn it into science, we have to make the manuscript into text. And that's where citizen science comes in, because at this point, there is no machine that can, uh, can read the text sufficiently accurate, accurately uh, that we can use it without doing a whole lot of QC anyway. So in terms of efficiency at this point, it's still um, better for humans to, um, to do uh, the transcription. And that's the role of old weather is to facilitate that process. And then um, <clears throat> that's when it goes into the, um, you know, we, you, we gather data, we QC it, and we put it in formats that we can, we can run the reanalysis on, which requires a, a massive supercomputer to, to run. This last generation I just showed you um, ran on a DOE supercomputer um, and produce, you know, the data set is in the in the petabyte range. So it's a, an enormous output of data um, from, you know, from these historical observations. Um, then I'm going to skip that part. And then I want to show you a couple of things um, about this, uh, what you're seeing here, this is our imaging station at the archives. So that's how we get most of the high resolution images you'll see later when we start working on the project. But anyway, you can learn all kinds of things about the project. There's the video I just showed you there. But I want to show you one of, one of these more specific examples of how you can use this to study an historical event. And what we, look, what we looked at for this website is um, what's called the Expedition Hurricane. This is a pivotal moment in the Civil War when the Union Navy was uh, put together a huge fleet and sailed to the south to try and capture a port somewhere uh, between Georgia and North Carolina that they could use as a depot and to help maintain the blockade, uh, so-called the Anaconda Plan, to basically close off the Confederacy by, um, by using a naval blockade. And so what happened is they, um, <coughs> sorry, they went down with an invasion fleet with the army and, and they um, attempted to take Port Royal, South Carolina, which they did eventually. But when they got there, there was this huge storm and they, uh, they, they called it the expedition hurricane even back then. But, um, you know, in, in those days, they, people didn't really understand what a hurricane was and any kind of bad storm tended to be labeled a hurricane. So we wanted to look at it and uh, in more detail to see what the reanalysis would do. Even in 1861, did we have enough data and enough computing power to resolve the storm? And I'll show you this other quick video. I'll just leave it on the screen right there. So this is reanalysis output of that storm. And you'll see it forming in the Gulf and then running right up the coast, right past Port Royal, where the Union Navy was situated. But um, while the risk was great uh, and the storm was severe, it turns out it wasn't quite a hurricane. It was still basically a tropical storm. But nevertheless, it, it created a temporary havoc among the Navy and scattered the fleet and delayed the invasion by a week or so. But um, at the end of the day, it was successful and the Union uh, established a depot at Port Royal, which uh, lasted well into the 20th century. Uh, and there's still quite a lot of uh, uh, military facilities around Port Royal um, to this day. But that just gives you a sense of, um, of how we can take the data and then turn it into something that can tell us a lot about history. Okay. Any questions so far? I'm gonna 
uh, or I'll move on to just showing you the new interface. Any questions? Okay. So I'm going to close that. And I'll shift over to the actual project here. So I'm going to move this over. Okay. So this is where, where the link that we sent around will take you. This is the, um, the actual transcription interface. It's hosted by Zooniverse. And this is a, um, this is a custom project that I put together um, just for this uh, um, opportunity. And uh, after, after uh, you guys get a chance to work on it for a while, we can open it to the public or, or maybe um, if, uh, if, if it's popular, um, uh, Natural History Society can finish it up and we'll just turn it into data and send you back a map of uh, what it looks like. Okay, so a couple of things. Um, what I would recommend uh, when you start is to first have a quick look at the about section. And that goes over the specifics about this particular project, about what, you know, why we're doing it, what we plan to do, uh, and some things about the ship. But also I put most of the, of the, uh, instructions for how to do the project in what's called the field guide. So if you look off to the right side of your screen, you should see a tab that says uh, field guide. It starts at the about page. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. So uh, if you just click on the tab, it opens a window and it gives you some options about stuff to learn about. And if we, are, if we were gonna start with the navigation workflow, you can just click there and it tells you what to look for in the logbook and the specifics of how to enter the data. It's pretty straightforward. The, the kernel of these instructions are also with every entry box, which I'll show you in a second. But what we're doing with navigation is just getting these coordinates from this box in the middle of the page. It's the latitude and longitude. So that's the first task of getting data that we can use because we have to know when and where it was collected. Um, so that's the first task. Um, there's, um, I wanna say a little over six months worth of logbook pages loaded. Um, so that will take us from the beginning of the voyage to, uh, to the Indian Ocean, I believe. Now, it's, this is an interesting ship to be working on. This is the USS Enterprise. Um, here, I'll, I'm gonna back up and show you this real quick. This is the Enterprise. This is a, a uh, steam and sail powered sloop of war that was built in 1877. Uh, this is a very typical Navy ship of the day. But what makes this particular data collection interesting is this is the first time, this voyage is the first time that uh, a Navy ship was spent, was sent all the way around the world with the purpose of sounding the depth of the ocean. So it's the very first dedicated cruise, um, dedicated to hydrography. And, you know, aside from what we're doing with old weather, if you watch the, the um, some of the news about X Prize and things like that, you'll know that we still haven't measured very much of the ocean. It's still a very important part of what, what is going on uh, scientifically, um, just basically to understand what the shape of the ocean is. And that's another problem we've been working on for 150 years. Um, but in this case, um, all that work was done with a sounding machine when piano wire. Um, so they could sound, as it turned out, they were they uh, managed to sound the, uh, the Puerto Rico trench. They didn't know it was a trench at the time, but they, uh, they got uh, a bottom measurement in something over 8,000 meters of water, which is quite a technical feat actually, uh, especially from a sailing boat like this. Anyway, so this voyage- And they did, that with, and they did that with piano wire? Yeah, um, there is a machine called a Sigsby machine, which was just a gigantic spool of piano wire and a weight 
and they would just drop the weight down to the bottom and measure how much wire went out. And uh, it would also um, collect a bottom sample. So bring back a little bit of mud or whatever the case may be. But uh, that is a surprisingly difficult thing because um, you know, 8,000 meters of wire of any kind is heavy. Uh, plus there's a hundred pound weight on the bottom to make it sink. And often what would happen if the, if the cannonball didn't fall off the bottom when it, when it struck the bottom, then they couldn't get the wire back up because the accumulated weight was too heavy and it would often break the wire. So there were technical challenges. Um, then there's one little, I should have put a picture of the Saudi machine, but if you look at this, if you look at the invent instructions, you can see this, the little um, circle there is a diagram of a Sigsby machine. Um, and the, the circle there in the middle is where all the wire is stored. I'll put a, uh, I can edit this um, uh, later on and I'll put some pictures of the Sigsby machine on the, on the field guide like this. So just to skip ahead, after, after we do the navigation, there is an events uh, workflow. And the purpose here is to, first of all, to give you an opportunity just to see what was going on and to make uh, short entries on whatever might interest you that uh, we would then record. Um, but the other, we need the date. The date is on this page. And also uh, we wanna keep track of what happens to the instruments or if there's any uh, information about the weather instruments that are in the remarks pages, like they broke something because, uh, Often uh, uh, these instruments aren't necessarily calibrated to each other. So we need to know when there's a change of instrument uh, so that we can look for the correction, for instance. Um, and on this page, there's also um, a bit of a photo gallery showing typical instruments of the day. Um, uh, the, a, the picture in, a, in the A box, that is a, a mercury barometer sometimes called the Q type um, cistern barometer. And this was in, um, this is the most common one to find uh, in the 19th century. But in the case of uh, the enterprise, they managed to break it and switch over to an aneroid, which is this other one uh, in B, that's an aneroid barometer. Um, it's very easy to use. It's not quite as accurate as a mercury one. Um, this particular example, of course, is from World War II. So, it looks a little more modern than the one that they would have had. And then um, in C, this is a, what's called a thermo screen and um, a wet and dry bulb thermometer. Uh, you see the, there's a little cup of water at the bottom and one of them has a, a uh, sort of a wick attached to, the, to one so that you get a wet bulb and a, and a dry bulb temperature and you can predict the dew point with that psychometric reading they would call it. And then to get sea surface temperature back in those days, it was a bucket and a thermometer. But it turns out that the kind of bucket makes a big difference in how that measurement is made because canvas of course gets wet. And then when you take it out of the water, it starts to evaporate. And so even in the time it takes to make a temperature measurement, that evaporative cooling uh, will change it a little bit. So knowing what kind of bucket it is, we can apply a bias correction uh, based on uh, the evaporative function that's going on. So it gets, sometimes it gets kind of uh, complicated, you know, making use of these old things. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, there, there are people who um, have spent a good portion of their careers trying to figure out these bias corrections. Okay. So let's look at, um, let's close this up and we'll go back to uh, homepage and then have a look at these workflows. So this, um, obviously this project is turned on. So I'm just gonna walk through these two workflows and enter uh, some of the data. Um, I've also set what's called the retirement number fairly low. I think it's set to two because with a small project like this, I can review all of it myself. Uh, it's within something that I can do in a day or two. So rather than have three or four volunteers transcribe the same things for redundancy, we'll leave it at two, knowing that for this project, 
we'll apply a little bit higher level of review than we normally do to make sure that uh, it's correct. Um, okay, so this is what navigation workflow looks like. <clears throat> It'll show you a, a page at random. Um, and we want to enter the latitude and the longitude if there is. So how you find that is if you just click on the image, you'll get this little pan and zoom indicator and you can move the page around and you can see, well, okay, there aren't any latitude and longitude data here. So that would be, um, you know, the starting with the second line, it says latitude DR at noon and then all the way down to longitude by chronometer. So it's four entries normally. And I'll tell you, um, since we're looking at it, DR stands for dead reckoning. So that is a means of keeping track of where the ship is solely based on the course and speed. And so the um, normally the ship's officers would keep a, a chart plot. And every time they change course or speed, they would plot that out on the chart. And then at noon, they would pick out the most reasonable position from that DR. But, and, and, I'll, and you'll see, because there's often both the DR and the positions by um, sextant by observation given, and you can see they're often a little bit different. And that's because, um, you know, there may be some compass error that's not compensated or uh, there may be a current or a headwind or whatever. So it's very common to be a few miles different uh, between the DR and the, what we would call a fix, which is a, a position derived from, um, uh, celestial navigation or from uh, compass bearings on a known landmark like a lighthouse or something like that. So, so what we we'll do here is since there isn't any data, I'm just gonna put a filler in, which is 999. And you can see that in the instructions just above here. And that just tells me that um, this page was looked at and there was no data, which uh, it's better than just having a blank because you're never quite sure why it's blank. Um, so that, that filler will tell me that there's no data, but then we come down to entering the port or place. And that um, you might've noticed at the beginning is here. And that is Cape Town in South Africa. So then here at port or place, you just put in Cape Town. If it is a less known place and there's a country or an island name, you can add that as, as well. So you could put South Africa here or SA, um, that would be found. So I could just put SA like that. Um, and in general, um, the rule is that you should type what you see, um, like so. If you, and I'll add this to the instructions here. I should have done that before, but I forgot. If you can't read it, you can just put not readable or put something in the box to say that there's a place that's not readable. And I will go back and uh, look at the surrounding pages and try and determine what it is and, and, and put that in during corrections. Okay. And then you just uh, hit done and you go, it takes you to the next place. Now, the other thing here is if you make a mistake, don't worry about it because somebody else is going to make the same entry uh, as part of the two, the two, um, the number two in the retirement limit. And then I'll take a look at it at the end of the project. Um, so don't worry about it. Um, we've done some uh, studies on correcting things. And it turns out that uh, when you try to correct something in the moment like this, the uh, chances of just making a different mistake are relatively high. So it doesn't, it doesn't warrant uh, reconfiguring the interface to allow it allow you to go back and correct things. So just don't worry about it. It'll be caught. Someone else will probably make the correct answer into the correct answer and we'll, uh, we'll pick it up later. Okay, so I'm gonna just um, not touch this workflow. I'm gonna go back to the home page. That's just gonna be left alone. That didn't, that didn't consume a, uh, one of the classification counts. It just, I just left, no problem. And then we'll look at this events workflow. So this, um, this is interesting. Um, 
you'll often find pages with inserts like this and some are some are flipped up and some are flipped down and so there's going to be two versions of this page one with the insert up and one with the insert down so that's going to kind of separate some of the data we need like here we can't get to the date because the insert is in the position that obscures it so okay the um so we have to make we have to make whatever notes here other than the um the date we can do that now um because when we get to the page with the insert down then you won't be able to see this part so it's going to be this page data we broke into two parts but that's okay so um this is where uh if we we're going to enter anything here i can i'll just type obscured here um and then here is just is there anything interesting yes. what would you put would you put 1883 there for the date or no just put everything i would just put obscure unless you can get the whole date it doesn't help uh too much um and we will get the whole date in the next appearance of this page um so the other two things are they're basically optional um if you see something that's interesting to you you can um you can type that in and then it will at least be entered in the data set. Like if there was a, a whale or something or sometimes birds lands on land on ships and if they say what kind of bird it is, that might be interesting uh, in your particular domain to know that there was an owl in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, for instance. Um, you know, so that's something you can do. Uh, but the main thing is to, um, uh, to see if there's a broken uh, a broken or changed instrument or something to do with the, the meteorology. That's what I'm really looking for in this section. And I think um, I might even add a, a entry box here for that purpose um, after we're finished with this part, uh, because I can, uh, I can go back and edit the project at any point and add things. So that might make it a little bit easier to separate those ideas. But anyway, so you just um, have a look through the page um, you can see here that they made a sounding in uh, 2,343 uh, fathoms, and they give a position here, uh, white sand and shell. Um, we don't really need to know the details. It wouldn't hurt um, uh, in this last box, you could just put a sounding. Uh, the reason we don't need to know specifically is that um, of the of the material um, that was published, this is the only thing I was able to find from the day. Is there's a uh, the captain the captain uh, Barker from the ship published all the soundings on his own in 1890 something. There's a link to that book in the field guide, by the way. But uh, that data is in a printed form, uh, which is easier to transcribe. So if we want to do that, we would do it from that from that source, uh, although that's not really in our remit with old weather. Uh, but it's nice to know that that's done. The positions may turn out to be useful because uh, these are probably um, DR positions that were brought forward for that particular time. So they are different than what you see on the navigation page. But um, since these are also printed, we will go back and look at that first before we ask volunteers to do something that's not essential because the the prime directive with old weather is to not waste anyone's time so if we know there is a place where we can get that bit of information without having someone transcribe it that's what we would do first uh, and then if it turns out that there's an issue with that then if we want to get these positions we come back and and have them have them go through old weather so in all cases we we make uh, an effort to be sure that what we're doing is is absolutely necessary um, and it gets more uh, a little more tricky in the 20th century because it's hard not always e easy to find out that something has been transcribed and ingested in the data set because uh, one of the things that happened um, after world war ii in the 50s some data was punched into our data set but the um, 
most of the metadata was lost in the process because they were using uh, IBM cards to punch in the data. And there's no room for the name of the ship on the IBM card. So uh, one of the other things we're doing as part of this project is to recover all of that information, which we just figured out how to do a couple months ago. Uh, and that's that's going to make a big difference to how uh, how the data set is used going forward. OK, so. I'm just going to have a quick look. At the rest yeah, of the so page. It's like, what 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 keywords are we looking for? Um, I guess when we're looking because this is the first time I'm seeing this I'm, I'm reading like cloudy but pleasant um, uh, no. barometer. So we don't need any um, of the weather descriptions because we'll um, uh, the the reanalysis will generate a um, uh, a reconstruction and then if we want to look at it in detail we would just go back to the primary source and look look that way um, so it's not um, it's not important enough that we would want people to spend a lot of time entering uh, cloudy but pleasant because uh, we can figure that out from the data most likely. Uh, but what we're looking for here is uh, things that are more unusual, like, or, or interesting to you. Like if there is an animal, um, you can make a note of it. And when the, when it's done, that, that will be noted in the, in the data report from this project and where things were seen. And certainly uh, a lot of work has been done in the past on whaling ships and where whales were located and, um, Back in the day, it was you know to figure out where to go so you can catch them, and now it's where were they and they aren't anymore. Uh, so that's you know that's how that kind of information can get used. So often people record uh, mammals and, and things like that, uh, or uh, mirages or earthquakes or things that are more uh, more unusual and interesting to to keep note of. And also, if you if you do a few of these things and you think of um, uh, more specific instructions uh, for things that you're interested in, I can add that to the workflow. Um, so uh, I'm just thinking back on another project um, where it turns out that there's another ship called the Albatross that uh, did some dredging work and they picked up a bunch of uh, deep sea coral. And that ended up in the Smithsonian's collection. And then one of my uh, other colleagues at the university was working on a technique to deduce the pH of the ocean from coralline structures. And so uh, once that connection was made, he was able to go to the Smithsonian and obtain some samples from the Albatross collection from 1890 and uh, extract the likely pH of that location. That's ocean acidification. And, uh, and so there's always these surprising uh, connections across disciplines and uh, between museum holdings and the logbook that are they're really um, rewarding when you come across these things. Okay. So I don't, uh, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time looking. I don't see much on this page that uh, other than just noting that there was a sounding uh, without going into any details. Um, Kevin? That's good. Huh? At the bottom of that page, it has typed in, examined, and found yeah. to be correct. Yes, that is um, typical because uh, these are official documents, even you know back when it was written. And so, generally, the navigator or um, some other officer would uh, review this copy. This is a this is what's called a smooth copy to make sure that it matches the rough log or however they were. You know, sometimes a ship will use a slate or something like that to write the weather stuff down, and then transfer it into the smooth copy. And those are always reviewed by more than one person um, at the end of every day. So, it was, so done, that's, it was done real time during the voyage. Yeah. 
Cool. Yeah. And so um, it's typical on all logbooks, um, especially from this era, that there'll be this examined and found to be correct. And sometimes it's the captain, sometimes the navigator, uh, like you see here, um, cosigns the copy. Thank you. Okay. All right. So that's basically the, the roundabout on that. Um, so at, at this point, um, we can have another round of questions or we can start working on the project. What would you like to do? Oh. Um, I'm not oh. sure. Oh. Oh, hold on yeah. a second. I just, I forgot something. Um, when, you know, ordinarily when you're working on this at home or wherever and something comes up and you do want to ask a question or you need some help, if you look at the top of the banner here, there's something called talk. If you go to talk, you can ask questions. And uh, there's a moderator, uh, Randy, which is on this, who is on this project. And uh, she is a very um, responsive to answering questions. So uh, if you wanna know basically anything, you can put your question here. Or if you see something neat, you can also put it here. Um, there's, a, there's also a means to put, um, to collect those page images and put them in talk so that the group can talk about that particular page and say, what do you think about this? And, um, and, and, and so that, that's a way that um, people can interact with someone experience uh, with this. So usually um, I keep an eye on talk and Randy is there um, most of the time, actually. She's doing the same thing for a World War II project as well. Could you could you show us how you can um, do a screenshot and put that in, or? Um, or is that is that on the is that on the um, platform? It is on the platform, and oddly enough, I've never done it because <laughs> uh, uh, usually I see them in talk, but I'm not. There must be a fairly straightforward way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. I don't know if Randy said she'd be around um, today, so I can just. So there's the question and uh, it should be answered sometime in the next hour or so. And then we'll know. And maybe we can um, maybe we can do as a uh, you can pull up on the project again uh, another page and we can mm -hmm. take turns looking at it and uh, uh, putting in information. Is that is that possible? Yeah, I can. I can open a page here, and yeah. or each of you could open a page. And um, while I'm here, if there's a question, uh, I can help answer that. I won't be able to see your page, obviously, because they're all uh, different once you open the page. But, um, you know, I can do this one um, again. And yeah. So this one uh, actually has all the uh, latitude and longitude stuff. So this, this is, uh, you can see the top banner. They're underway and they're heading from Porta Praia uh, to somewhere. It's on the other page. But what we're after here are these coordinates. So I would just enter, uh, according to the format, this would be a south because it's in the southern hemisphere. 30, 56, 19. And then the longitude is west, 22, 35. Nine. Um, and this here's another tip too. Um, you can move the move the page around, and sometimes it's handy to put it right up by where the entry boxes are, and you can also make it bigger. So whatever size works for you, then then you can put them right next to the place where you're working, and it's just easier for your eye to follow the you know the entries. So that's south.
So here's another uh, point. So I, I'm not quite sure what that is. I think it's a zero four. Um, and the rule is put in what you think it is, whatever you see, that's what you type in. Um, and it will, it will, um, it will get corrected at some point. And it does make sense uh, because that's only a couple of miles from 3056. So it's really quite, those two positions are fairly close, even though it is, um, you know, there's a degree change but they're right next to each other. So I'm just gonna put zero four, because that's what I see in zero six for seconds. And here, west 22, 1748, like so. And I'll just have a quick look to confirm. And that's, that looks pretty good to me. The, um, yeah, they're actually pretty close to each other too. So that's that's good. Their DR is fairly good. And then we just hit done. I'm gonna try pushing done and talk. I've never done that before either. Let's see what happens. Whoa, there we go. That's how you do that. So if you go done and talk, uh, here's that picture and you can make comments about it. We figured it out. Well, maybe. Um, oh, there's a discussion board set up. All right, I'll have to look into that. So it looks like um, there should be uh, something done right here that I did. Oh, try this. Okay, so now we're, it bounces over to talk. It's showing a page and it starts a thread. So now you can start talking about this page. Okay. That's pretty easy. Perfect. And uh, I think, um, I think that um, you'll get an option to talk about a page if someone else were to do that and that's where it would go, talk about a page. And then there'll just be a string of uh, uh, that looks like this, and you can talk about the page. The other thing, uh, which is handy, is these little uh, things down at the bottom here. You can um, find out the metadata for the page, which um, in this case, it links back to the uh, holdings at the National Archives. So you can go back to this whole volume if you do. Um, if you do right click, uh, open in a new tab. And the reason we do that is that uh, the markdown language that we use to create the website doesn't have the utility built in to open a new tab. And so it'll take you away from the site. And so whatever you were doing, you would then just, it would, you'd have to go back to it manually. So if you open in a new tab, um, Here's the here's this, the volume we're working on at the National Archives, and so you can you can then um, if you're really curious, you can um, so that's image 59. So you can come here and uh, load all, and if we get to image 59, this should be that page. And it looks like the same page. And so then you can, um, you can figure out what's going on that day with a little more, um, you know, uh, you can see both pages. You can also um, jump back and forth between pages. So if there's something that you're curious about, you can, you can access the primary source at the National Archives, which is kind of handy. Oh, that Sometimes. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay.
So if somebody has asked that this this platform reminds them of visuality, did you see that uh, that that comment? Is that in the chat? Yeah. Oh, you can't see the chat. It says, "Are you is this platform reminds me of visuality? Are you coordinating efforts? Looks like geolocation errors are less of a problem when building a top and uh, top in the me. Top on. I'm not sure how you pronounce that word. Topo. So if I um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Chat. Okay. Uh, I figured out how to open the chat. Okay. So this is the last question in chat. Uh, it's the second to last question. Uh. Uh oh, oh, actually, it doesn't show up in my chat window for some reason. Oh no, sorry. It was a direct message to me. It wasn't. To, it was. <laughs> Uh, uh, it. So it, uh, there is a question here. All the are the positions always at noon, uh, and that that is true. It is there is always a position at noon. Sometimes there are other positions, uh, like the positions written in the remarks page on the where the soundings took place. But at this, in this era, um, the noon position was basically the the target for the day, and they didn't. Uh, you know, they may have kept a running plot on a chart with positions written on it, but those aren't, uh, at this time in history, they weren't recorded in the logbook. I know for a fact that uh, back in the day when I was navigating slow, solely with a sextant, we would put uh, morning stars and evening stars, a morning line of position, a noon position, afternoon line of position. Uh, we would generate all of those things and um, they were mostly recorded on the plotting sheet and only the noon position was written in the log. I put, I put, uh, the, I put, I put the, um, the, the question in the chat box for you. Yeah, I have not used visu visuality. Um, there are a couple other um, platforms I think you can work with uh, to build a citizen science project, but we're, we've been happy with Zooniverse uh, so far. And uh, so I haven't really branched off into other other platforms. All right. We were, we were in, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say that we were the, um, the first transcription project that Zooniverse built. And, uh, and so we, we um, funded quite a lot of that uh, development. And so we're, we also have a little bit of loyalty to them, to them, I think. And it's a good platform. Kevin, could you go to um, that, the event, the next one for the event, so we can do that kind of as a group and look at it together while you're here? Sure. Uh, I'm going to move my, let shrink that. So this is another events page. Uh, if you click on events, you're going to see a different page. Everyone should see a different page. And here, uh, there is a date. So this is going to be, uh, 1602, 1883. Then yeah, this um, the other project that we're doing right now is uh, from the World War II era, and that is typed, and that um, uh, kids are doing much better with that than they would do with this. Uh, Especially this really slanty cursive is, um, I think, hard for. Oh, interesting. Right in the middle, it says um, instruct, instruction, instructing boys in English studies at 1030. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. So um, that's one of the things that the, you know, especially in the 19th century, the Navy had a lot of young people um, and young midshipmen, uh, you know, just like in, in the Royal Navy. So maybe 14, 15, 16 years old. And they had, they ran a school. I mean, every Navy ship had essentially a school for the midshipmen and apprentices. Um, and it's, it's, it was also the case that they needed instruction, just like a high school on land here, you know, they need to know a lot of math actually, and English and, you know, quite a lot of basic education was provided by the, by the Navy for the young people interested in a career, uh, who were, you know, a good part of their, uh, instruction took place at sea on a ship and they were expected to also participate in whatever the ship was doing whether that was a in war or in peace here they're talking about instructing the apprentices uh, of the starboard watch in english in porch uh, the port watch is studying signaling which would be in those days um uh, flag, you know, flag hoist and things like that. Huh, that's interesting. It does say that there was a sounding. Yeah. 2,212 meters. So I'll just put sounding. So, you know, just because I think it's um, kind of interesting, I can put instructing boys uh, just as a note, like I can come back and find this page, uh, you know, from the data once we get it reduced. And I have no particular interest in it, but somebody might. I mean, it, it's uh, kind of an interesting historical thing that would be fair enough to put in there. So Kevin, out of all the ones that you've been looking at and other people have been seeing, what, is, what are some of the most um, uh, kind of unusual things that, that, were you, that have been found in these logs? Um, so one of the things that uh, for the Arctic ships that we recorded regularly was, well, two things. Um, in the Pacific Arctic area, we would... Um, always record whether an aurora was seen and we record a volcano if we ran it uh, you know like Bogoslav if it was erupting uh and the ship saw it and noted in the logbook that we would keep track of both of those things and then um we would uh as, as, well, yeah so there were scientists specifically interested in those things and we would collect a pile of them and then relay that stuff to um to someone who was doing space weather and the volcano stuff we would send to um, the Alaska Volcano Observatory because they keep a chronology of eruptions um, as, a, uh, as a means of understanding the, the time domain of, uh, of particular volcanoes that are re-erupting regularly, semi-regularly, like Bogoslav. Um, and that information would also go to the Smithsonian Volcanology Project as a, it's just a byproduct of, of old weather that we would just um, keep track of that stuff and then relay it along uh, periodically. Um, I mean, are, there, are there any kind of idiosyncrasies seen in, in terms of captains? That, who, who's making these logs on the boat? Is it a captain's log or? Uh, it's not exactly. It, it is a requirement of the Navy and um, and it's also um, a requirement now of the merchant marine that you keep a certain kind of log that has certain information in it. And uh, so that was written into the um, standing orders of the Navy that this had to be done. And after the Civil War, um, they really strengthened the, um, uh, the directive to keep track of the weather every hour. Uh, prior, you know, during the Civil War and prior, they... There was a suggestion, but not every captain would 
actually carry it out. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily keep the format. I mean, everyone got the same kind of printed log, but in the Civil War, uh, sometimes they would just write over the tables uh, as if they weren't there. Um, you know, the Constitution, uh, the probably the most famous ship in the Navy of the, of, you know, from the day, they did that a lot. And it's quite irritating to me. <laughs> That's you know that's that's uh, weather weather data that could have been obtained that that never will be now. But after after the Civil War, um, uh, the logbooks look a lot more like this one, where it's very uh, very clean and thorough. So they they seldom miss any uh, weather observations. And how far back are you going in terms of this um, project in in inputting the data? Uh, we have uh, worked on material from the 1840s, and uh, and and that that's good. Although we found that um, uh, both Civil War and before, it's a little bit trickier to understand what the data is because it's not not as uh, as much metadata available, and it was more inconsistent uh, because of the captain's sort of willingness to, you know, to, to maintain the form. But something happened after the Civil War. They, they must have gotten a, a stern talking to from uh, the hydrographic office. <laughs> and, and are there similar projects going on in other countries where they're looking at their own um, logs from their navies? Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, we, we are part of a international initiative called ACRE, which is one of those obscure scientific acronyms, which means um, atmospheric reconstructions over the earth. Because, you know, every science project has to have an acronym that reads like something. I don't know, it's cultural. Um, but there's, there, there are many countries represented, many national weather services represented in the ACRE initiative. And, and so old weather is part of that. In fact, our um, if we look at the team, uh, if we go to about, whoops, wrong about, that's about this universe. Uh, this about, you can see the team right here. And, you know, so here's me, but uh, working with me is um, Professor Ed Hawkins at Reading, he's UK. Philip Broen is at the Met Office in the UK. Gil Campo is the scientist behind the 20th century reanalysis, and he's part of the project. Uh, Praveen is a postdoc with Ed, and uh, Mark Milan uh, is now the deputy historian of the Coast Guard, but he used to be um, uh, an archivist, and he and I uh, started the uh, imaging program at the National Archives. And so there's people from all over the place of different disciplines uh, involved in the project. Would it be of interest if in the log, the um, person recording cited another vessel, where that vessel was from, what flag it was flying, stuff like that? Yeah, that actually would be interesting, um, especially if it's, another, uh, if it's another Navy ship, another U.S. Navy ship, because uh, one of the ways we can keep track of the quality of the data is to do ship to ship comparisons. And so if they were, uh, say, they would often write down their moored in a place with all these different ships, then, um, then we can go to those logs and get that data and then uh, uh, do an inner comparison of the data, which is interesting. Thank you. That's one of the reasons um, uh, we're doing the, um, the World War II project we're working on now um, which is nearly done, but that was one of the reasons we did that project because I knew going when I selected the ships, they're all part of the same uh, destroyer squadron or whatever. So I know they're often going into the same place at the same time, and that gives us a means to uh, to understand bias in the data, which for that project is the main the main mission. Okay. Um, 
Do we have any other questions? Does everybody feel comfortable with the um, the task at hand that we've been given? I will take the the silence as a, a, a affirmative. Yep, yep, Connor, yep, Andrew, yep, okay. So, um, we, we, we have what, 40, about a little less than 45 minutes in the schedule, is that right? We do, but if everybody yeah. feels comfortable, maybe we can, we can disperse early and if we have prop questions, we can use that talk function and uh, uh, do that if, if everybody feels comfortable. I'm also happy to just stand by here if, uh, if, uh, if, if anyone wants to do this now. I'm happy to take questions just by standing by here and maybe I'll do a few classifications myself if uh, if there's a, a quorum that wants to do that right now. If we want to break up, then then, then uh, we can just uh, oops, some, um, we can just do that over talk over the coming days. <laughs> 